I hope you all survive the midterm. Um, we, the plan is, because Carrie and Katie were away at a conference at Yale all of this weekend, um, that they will grade your papers this week and will return them to in the lecture um, next Tuesday. Okay? Um, so, uh, um, so that's the schedule on the midterm um, grading issue. Um, those of you who were taking the midterm, um, when, while you were taking the midterm, I sent an email out to everyone who's opted to do the research paper, which seemed a little cruel when I was doing it. Um, but if you aren't on that list and you want to be on that list, you have to let me know right away. Okay, so last um, Tuesday, I was talking about a... Is this very echoey? Is it just my... Yeah? Um, last Tuesday, I was talking about doing a pair of lectures on responses to the Great War. Um, uh, on the sort of legacies and responses... Um, of the war. And so if you'll remember, if you can even begin to recall your life before the midterm, um, on that Tuesday I talked about the sort of cultural and political responses to the Great War, and I talked about the attempt to restabilize Britain after the experience of that great chaos and carnage through a flight to the countryside and to the comforts of a new type of domestic suburban life. But I also talked about a political process in which both in Britain and across the empire there was a growing tide of unrest and a series of types of emergency measures um, to try and restore order and stability, and you saw that in terms of the response to the general strike in Britain and to the various um, forms of repression. I think I gave you the examples of Ireland, Iraq, and uh, India. So today I'm going to pick up that story, and I'm going to focus instead on what we might call the sort of economic um, consequences of the war. Um, and the attempt to try and imagine a different type of society and a different type of economic management um, that is generated from this experience of crisis. So the big issue, really, that we're talking about in these last three lectures on the war and on the attempt to restabilize Britain and, and today is what was going to be the response to the Great War? Was it fought to defend an old vision of liberal England, to try and restore the conditions of, of Victorian liberalism of the 19th century that had made Britain great, or was it going to be about trying to build a new type of society? And you'll see today that I'm going to talk about that in the realm of economic and social policy. And so the question is going to be, does Britain go back to free trade the gold standard, and all that good stuff, or does it try and do something quite um, decisively different? Now, the basis for thinking about a new type of social organisation rested very much on what became the new vogue for planning, of thinking about the scientific management of social and economic life. And I'm going to suggest to you today that that was made possible by the sort of increasing visibility and familiarity with science and technology. Pretty much in the Victorian period, Throughout the 19th century, 
science and technology had been experienced from a distance. It was a type of spectacle. Um, increasingly, in the 1920s and the 1930s, science and technology becomes embedded in people's everyday lives. It ceases to be, they cease to be a sort of austere, threatening uh, thing. At least for some people. Okay? Now you know from reading um, uh, Huxley's um, Brave New World that there was an alternative view of science and technology. A, a view of science and technology that very much comes out of the genre of science fiction, which itself was a creation of the late 19th and early 20th um, uh, century. I mean, H.G. Wells is really the, 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 the author that starts all of this with his novel The Time Machine um, in 1895 and The War of the Worlds in um, 1898. But increasingly, science fiction becomes dystopian in its vision. It, it sees science and technology as producing not the liberation of mankind, not the forward march of industrial progress that had characterized the, the uh, Victorian belief, but in fact a, a implosion of it, um, a sort of dehumanizing, um, uh, a, a dehumanizing experience. And probably the classic illustration of that was not just A Brave New World, but Charlie Chaplin's fabulous film, A Modern Times, which I'm just going to play you a very brief um, uh, clip of. Now this film comes out in 1940, okay, and clearly, you know, Chaplin with his little moustache is telling us where this vision of, you know, a technocratic industrial mass produced type of world is leading. It's leading to a world of conformity, it's leading to a world of standardization, it's leading to a dehumanization that allows the type of barbarity that Hitler came to represent um, in, um, the, in the Second World War. And yet, I want to emphasize that for many people, technology becomes not such a distant and terrifying prospect. This was the generation that began to live with technology in their home. You have, in 1926, the creation of the National Grid in Britain, which is the electricity um, uh, uh, system. There are um, new... Uh, the number of homes with electricity are growing by about 750,000 uh, 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 homes a year between the 19 t in the 1920s and 1930s. By 1938, they're 9 million homes um, on the electrical grid. And with that came all the new types of technology that electricity enabled. The telephone. Um, in 1922, there were about a million people with a telephone in their house. And by 1938, that had risen to about 3 million. 
the wireless, the radio, the radio set. Um, that the BBC was created, as we'll see next week in 1922, becomes an increasingly um, a, a, a familiar part of everyday life um, in, in Britain. In 1928, you get the arrival of the talkies, so, um, movies with sound, um, and uh, as we'll see again in a couple of weeks, everybody is attending the um, uh, uh, the uh, cinema. So in a really important way, technology is becoming embedded in people's lives in an increasing way and doesn't have this frightening, uh, this frightening series of connotations that it had for um, Huxley and for um, Chapter. Indeed, many people thought science and technology would provide the solution to the modern world, that it wasn't the problem of the modern world, it was the solution. Many people saw it as a way of being able to advance a particular uh, political agenda. Probably the greatest example here is the scientific socialism of people like J.D. Bernal, B-E-R-N-A-L, and um, J.B.S. Haldane, H-A-L-D-A-N-E. Other people, and this is going to be the thing that I talk most about today, seen science and technology as a way of rising above politics, of providing a new type of neutral um, science of government, rather like Chadwick and his followers believed statistics could do in the 1830s, so in the 1920s and the 1930s, people believed that there were new forms of expertise that would allow government to be impartial and, and more efficient. So let me turn to the economic chaos in Britain after the war. And I'm going to do so under these three headings. I'm going to talk to you first about the debt that Britain was in as a consequence of the First World War and the attempt to try and return after the war to the principles of liberal political economy. And then going to talk about how they fail and how there's a new domestic or reorientation of the economy around consumer goods and the domestic market. And finally, we'll talk about um, the uh, unprecedented scale of unemployment and what that would mean. Now, the important thing for you to get on this slightly congested slide is that Britain emerges from the First World War um, in a, not a perilous financial position, but a financial position that was fundamentally at odds with the whole philosophy of cheap government and keeping the national debt down that had um, uh, pervaded throughout the 19th century. The size of the national debt rose from 706 to over 7,000 um, million pounds during the war. Um, and many of those loans, of course, came from the United States. The graph that you see here maps that um, historically as a, the, the national debt in terms of the, per, uh, 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 the percentage of GDP. And so you can see that, as I've been telling you all along, that after the Napoleonic Wars, the new principle of cheap government came in and there's a massive scaling down of the degree of national debt. When you hit the First World War, it heads very quickly in the um, uh, other, di uh, other direction. And basically, that continues up through the end of the Second World War. Um, 